So with this uh, presentation talk, I'm talking about various projects that we have carried out with our Cypriot collections at Museum Sheffield. Um, and I called the talk uh, Putting Cyprus on the Map because I know we like a good pun at SMA conference. Um, and essentially, before I started the project, I didn't exactly know where Cyprus was. I knew it was an island, <laughs> somewhere in the Mediterranean. <laughs> so for those of you who are as equally ignorant as me, here is a map of the Mediterranean. Cyprus is this island um, at the far end of the Mediterranean, uh, in the east, south of Turkey, near the um, Lebanese coast, north of Egypt. I suppose some of you are wondering how we have ended up with um, some Cypriot objects in uh, Sheffield. Um, the collection is about 250 objects. It includes ceramic, glass and metal objects. Um, and part, most of it came in in 1897, was purchased in 1897. A large part is um, the collection of somebody called uh, Re the Reverend Julius de Bear, who was a Roman Catholic chaplain at Limassol on the south of Cyprus. Um, and we purchased it from Reverend, Reverend Father Rusmalin from... Um, we don't know very much about who Reverend uh, De Bear and um, Reverend Rusmalin were, so I can't really tell you much more, but that's something we hope to find out more about in the future. And then more objects were also donated uh, that were previously part of Reverend Rusmalin's um, collection. Those were donated in, in the 60s. The other part, the other major contributor to the collection is um, Thomas Backhouse Sandwith. And this was the part that was purchased from the Sheffield sale room, so I skipped ahead in my notes. Um, about 30 items from his collection. Um, and he is a more well-known collector um, and his material has made its way to many museums around the UK. He was, um, he was British Vice Consul in Cyprus between 1865 and 1870. Um, and presumably as well as his diplomatic duties, he was very interested in the history and culture of Cyprus and he gathered a large collection of artefacts. Um, he presented an important paper on uh, Cypriot pottery in 1871 and that was one of the first modern studies of Cypriot archaeology and that was later published in the journal Archaeologia. So moving on to the work that we have done at Sheffield. A lot of what I'm talking about is bread and butter stuff that you do with your collections every day but the idea of this, uh, the talk is to talk about these different strands, um, none of which were a, a strategic overview plan, unlike the, the talk that um, Anna gave about their project, which was obviously planned from the start. This was just different things that happened that are kind of led to a, a whole um, thing. Um, so the first thing that we started to do was uh, to document the collection onto our computer database. Um, we obviously had the collection cards from um, 1897, the one on the, the left, um, including what I always love about our cards. This is one of those ones that records um, that it was damaged in a German air raid in uh, 1941, 1940, sorry, um, and also the cards from the 1960s. But uh, very few of these were on the computer database. Um, so we started by just creating skeleton records um, and uh, it was a priority for documentation as it's a relatively large and significant collection and acquired during the formative years of the museum. And they, have, they have been very little studied and um, the identifications and things were mostly from back in 1897 um, and needed dates and things to be brought up to modern standards. There had been some interest in the collection through inquiries, some recent interest. Um, for example, um, Anna Reeve, who is a um, PhD researcher exploring the origins and history of the ancient Cypriot art collections in Leeds. Um, she visited in 2013 and wrote this uh, very flattering, kind blog about it. Um, and additionally, Dr. Thomas Kiley, who is the A.G. Leventis Curator of Ancient Cyprus at the British Museum, um, he contacted Sheffield um, to find out what do we have, um, having read a historical reference to some Cypriot antiquities ending up in Sheffield. Um, so in general, we felt the collection of the profile should be raised. 
and we felt that documenting it would be quite straightforward as the majority of it had already been unpacked into cabinets. In 2003, um, the old Sheffield City Museum, as it was then, was closed. All the archaeology that was at that time stored in the basement in various places was packed up um, and transported to an off-site store. And since then, we have been working to unpack it. Um, and so some of it is still in its, its boxes from 15 years ago. Um, but this, had the, this material had been unpacked into cabinets uh, so it could be seen and we could, um, it would be relatively easy to access. So, as I say, we began by collect, creating skeleton records from the catalogue cards, but most of these records obviously lacked locations and photos, so they were very far from spectrum compliant. The next step was conservation. Um, in 2015-16, we had, a, had Heritage Lottery funding to redevelop some of the galleries at the museum, including creating a new archaeology gallery. It's a project called a, Bo a Bright Future. Um, and there was some, essentially some leftover conservation money um, that I was told this needs to be spent um, because obviously you allocate a certain amount for conservation and then it turned out we didn't need as much for <coughs> the things that were going on display. Um, so the criteria was it was things that were going to go on display at some point in the future. You've got two months to get it all spent up. So um, uh, we used this money to carry out a conservation assessment of the whole Cypriot collection and the remedial conservation of some of the pieces. Um, so uh, this had the, um, the added step that obviously as we were going through taking everything off the shelves, we were able to um, locate the items because we had the skeleton records it was easy to just match up the um, the number the accession number and, and add that you weren't doing everything from scratch and similarly those where we didn't have dimensions or, or they were in uh, not feet but inches which I, I can't get to grips with um, we were able to um, uh, update all that information so layering up enriching the records um, these are just some before and after shots of uh, conservation so uh, two pieces on the left and this is what they look like after conservation um, so essentially we went through and picked the the worst pieces or the things that we felt something could be done with um, and this is my not quite favorite but this is a sad little pot that during the 2003 move unfortunately got broken um, I've only come across one thing, so given you know, the many thousands that were moved, it's not too bad. Um, we kept the pieces in a box for 14 years, and uh, this is what it looks like now. So, um, okay. One of the reasons that I chose the Cypriot collection to spend this conservation money on was because concurrently with this, we... Um, uh, had been contacted, um, or Thomas Kiley at the British Museum um, had uh, contacted us about a project that um, the Cyprus Institute, which is an academic institute in Cyprus, um, are running um, to create a, a database, a, a website of Cypriot antiquities in foreign museums, as it says on the tin. Um, and so the idea behind this database is that uh, students, academics who are studying Cypriot antiquities will know where stuff is around the world. It will have photographs, it will have identifications, dates, measurements, etc. Um, we uh, had almost no photographs um, when we uh, started the project. During the conservation um, assessment, we took record shots of everything. Um, and um, the Cyprus Institute offered to fund um, photography of the collection, um, which, uh, as well as supplying the funding, it was made, made an easier project because we already knew where the things were, so it was easy to say, OK, well, this accession number, it's on this shelf. And it was easier to keep track of um, which photos had been done or not, um, because a lot of the pieces um, are quite similar. Obviously, if you're a specialist, they look completely different. Um, but, you know, when you're faced with 
six or seven amphora, you have to look quite closely to see which one is which. Or, um, so having those record shots made it much easier to say, oh, that's that one or, or whatever. Um, also, as part of uh, the project, they wanted the dimensions. We had that information already from the work we'd done during the conservation assessment. And as we were continually going through the records, adding information about the conservation, the location, the measurements, I personally got to know the collection a lot more from, from a position of not even really knowing we had such a collection, because I've been, only been at Museum Sheffield for three, only about two years when we started the project. Um, I gradually got to know them much more and knew you know, how many amphoras or, or what things were interesting or whatever. And, he sent, and by the end of this, pretty much all the records were spectrum compliant. So from our point of view, um, that's helping towards one of our accreditation targets and an easier way to sell it to managers to say, well, I'm not just you know, messing about with collections, even though that's what you pay me to do. Um, we will go from having, you know, this will reach you know, 250 spectrum compliant records. Um, uh, unfortunately, the photography nearly didn't happen as there was a lot of toing and froing about what funding was available and what we would need to supply in order to receive the funding. Um, I was just looking back through my emails um, in preparation for this talk and I've forgotten quite how much there was you know, well, this is how much it will cost and, you know, this is how long it will take us. And then they would say, well, that's a bit more than we were hoping to spend. And um, we could do this or we could do that. Um, and so we had to have a, a really uh, strong sense of what it was that we would get out of it. Um, because as, as you know, everybody's time is limited and you've got to think, well, is this going to help us reach our strategic goals? Will it reach those accreditation targets or those Arts Council England targets or whatever, rather than it just being a nice thing to do? Um, so, uh, for example, um, you know, the initial talk of Bain about just supplying those record shots that we have. Well, we didn't really feel comfortable about having those out there on the internet. Um, if I show you, uh, here on the left is one of the record shots, and this is actually one of the better ones that I took because there's nothing in the background. But for speed, we just shoved those bits of plastiso under to stop the, the pot falling over. Um, on the uh, right hand side is the um, uh, professional photography one where a decent background, and she's done lots of work on you know colour <coughs> balancing and things like that. Um, so one even as part of as part of kind of trying to work out how long it would take us to photograph them, my colleague and I um, took, I think, just one shelf's worth of, of material, so 10 um, objects, transported them to our photography studio as a two, too strong a term, a place where we have a plain background um, and decent lighting, um, took 10 pictures, and then I spent time cropping those and changing the balance of the colour and that took a whole afternoon just to do 10. So we were like, well, you know, the amount of time it would take us to do that at, while all the other work is building up. We had to say, well, we can't do that. Um, and um, so uh, and uh, uh, at one point they came back with the funding offer where they said we can give you this amount of money for professional photography, which would have photographed about 100 items, but you need to supply um, the rest of them, which would have been about 130. So based on that calculation, well, that's, I can't do my maths. It's not 26 afternoons, I don't know. A lot of afternoons to do, um, to do that. And it felt bad going back to them and saying, well, thanks very much for the offer, but we're not going to get enough out of it. Because you're, you're always so sort of in museums, oh, it'd be great to get some money in, but... Um, yeah, I didn't want to say no, but my line manager made me see sense. Um, and it worked out in the end uh, because um, they were then able to offer us um, more money, which meant we could get the whole lot professionally photo photographed. Um, so from our, so it was a, I felt like it was a case of if us being clear about what we um, what we needed, what suited us, what would give us a good outcome meant that there was good out a good outcome on both sides because they could well still be waiting for those uh, 130 photographs if we'd gone with that first option. Um, volunteers, everybody always involves volunteers. Ours were just press ganged 
Uh, every work experience or placement student was uh, contributed by editing the photographs um, and adding them to our computer database. So we had over 300 photographs and so it was very helpful to have them do that work bit by bit and they have also been helping by preparing the records and um, to go onto our online uh, uh, system so that they will be shared um, outside the museum. <coughs> um, we, my colleague uh, Leanne Baldridge and I visited um, the British Museum and we met with Thomas Kiley here on the photographs and we viewed um, the Cypress Gallery and the stores and um, then we began to understand um, the strengths of the, she the Sheffield collection, strengths and the weaknesses. Because um, again, when you're, when you're just working with one collection, you've no idea whether it's you know, run of the mill, if there's anything exciting in it, especially if it's not a, a subject you'd, you'd studied. Um, in, you know, my degree had focused on British archaeology, so it was a new, a new step for me. Um, I also attended a workshop um, at uh, the British Museum called Exploring Cyprus, where various um, curators who look after Cypriot collections um, came together and heard uh, presentations. Um, and again, for me, that was one of those of finding out that other, where other museums sit um, in terms of significance, which other museums have got them. So I was surprised to find out that Hastings Museum, for example, have got quite a significant collection of Cypriot um, archaeology. And a, a small moment where I went, oh, but ours is bigger than theirs, you know. But whether it's better, I don't know. Um, and at that meeting, the idea of having a classical collections subject specialist network was raised. Um, and the idea... Um, came to fruition at a workshop um, in September 2018. Um, I couldn't attend the workshop. Um, it's being organised by Vicky Donnellan, who I shall point out in the audience. Um, so and that's another way of bringing together people. Um, and hopefully that will be something that will happen, that people can... Um, well, as we know, the idea of subject specialist networks being that you can focus on a certain area, um, and even if you're not an expert in it, um, you can find other other experts. Um, so, and obviously, I was able to let Vicky know of our interest in joining, um, and tell other people about our, our chef, uh, about the collection at Sheffield. So, naturally, uh, this is just the a shot from the um, the galleries at the British Museum. Naturally, this all led on to a display. Um, so. Uh, in the, in the new archaeology gallery, it was designed deliberately that there would be several cases that would house uh, temporary uh, displays um, of material. Um, and I'm quite keen for also for that to be some of our non-British material, because the main displays um, cover the, the British material that we have in the collection. Um, and so it seemed quite a natural next step to choose the, the Cypriot material for the next temporary display, as well as uh, fulfilling that Heritage Lottery Fund requirement that we had spent the conservation money on things that would go on display. Um, not that I expected anyone to turn up and check, but still, still good to keep to the terms of your grant, isn't it? Um, so this is, uh, the exhibition is called Cyprus Island of Copper, and it's these two cases, sorry, yes, two cases that you can see here. Um, uh, so, um, during preparation for the exhibition, I made uh, quite a lot of use of the British Museum's online research catalogue um, and the Cypress Gallery at the British Museum. And it was quite an interesting experience writing interpretation when it feels like you're only one step ahead of the public in your knowledge of the subject. Um, you know, you're sort of writing something thinking, is this right? And Thomas Kiley at the British Museum was very, very helpful. Um, when it came to the sort of precision things like assigning dates to an object. So I wrote the draft text um, and just sent it all to him and said, help, if I've written anything that's wrong, can you put dates on things? Um, and obviously, I've then added all that information to our online computer, uh, to our computer database. So uh, it's all kind of feeding back. Um, my, my next uh, plan is, so I suppose he looked at about 70 or 80 objects I guess I could send him the other hundred and something and see 
can you put dates on those? But obviously, if he has identified one, then I can assume that the other ones that are fairly similar are going to be a similar date. So it's all very helpful. Um, I also made use of the blog by Anna Reeve um, in making connections with other museums and finding out more about uh, the collectors. As part of the display, we ran a couple of sessions with Young Archaeologist Clubs, one with the Peak District Young Archaeologist Club and one with Sheffield. Um, and these were pretty easy to do because I'm a leader with the Peak District uh, Club and my colleague Leanne's a leader with the Sheffield one. So again, kind of an, uh, just an example of, it's something I want to do anyway, but because I was already involved with them, it was very easy just to say, can we do a session? It wasn't a case of finding who to contact, persuading them that we're not weird or dodgy, you know, telling them that yes, it would be interesting. And from my point of view, easier, because I knew the space I would be working in, um, I knew the, the children, the young people that I'd be working with, um, I knew who would not pay attention. <laughs> um, and uh, so the last co-curated display that we did, we worked with a collection that I'm more familiar with, um, a, a, an Iron Age uh, hill fort in Sheffield um, and Roman material, but we worked with a new community, a community group I haven't worked with before. So kind of a way of not every aspect of a project I think needs to be new, you know, as long as perhaps one or two aspects are new and then you can be rooted in the bits that you do know. Um, otherwise you could just be flailing around um, and it's not a positive experience on either side. Um, we got them in this, uh, in these images, you can see that they are, we got them to lay out their own displays um, uh, of, um, uh, of the pottery. Um, one of them just cut the bit of paper that I gave them in, into strips and stuck them down. And when I said, well, that's not really very creative, they said, yeah, but it's easier to do it that way. Well, okay, can't argue with that. Um, we also got them to do drawings uh, inspired by um, the collections. And then we've incorporated, we've displayed some of those drawings in the displays. Um, and we also, you did, we did that classic thing of getting them to record an object and I encourage them to write their own comments and their own opinions about it. And those have then, uh, the more interesting ones have been incorporated into the labels. Um, so we have this uh, jug here, um, and then three comments um, from the uh, Young Archaeologist Club members, just about what they think it might be like. Um, and I feel that, um, A, because it's somebody saying it, yeah, this is probably t would be too much text for me, for me to be writing reams and reams about it. Um, and it makes it clear that it's not, um, you don't necessarily have to be quite so academic. So for example, I would never have written, some people think it's an elephant, because that's quite you know, authoritative and also not very true. Um, it was really only Amy who thought it was an elephant. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, I think it, it, and perhaps encourages the, the public as well to feel that it's okay to have their own opinions about things. Um, so um, I also gave a public talk um, about the collection, um, and, um, which Anna Reeve tweeted about, <laughs> and then she wrote a blog on the, um, on the display. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So the outcomes of the projects, or the various projects, well, number one, I now know where Cyprus is, very firmly. And I'm familiar with the collection <laughs> and its significance and locally and nationally. Um, so, for example, this uh, uh, vessel on the left-hand side is a, a red polished ware composite vessel. Um, when I first saw it, I thought, oh, that's just quite quirky and, and not very practical. Well, it now turns out that it's not meant to be practical. They were made deliberately for a funerary context. They weren't used day to day. Um, and Thomas Kiley, for example, was very excited when he saw it. So now I know it's, you know, it's not, they're not ten a penny. Um, other things we do have that are ten a penny um, in Cypriot archaeology context. Um, on the right hand side um, is a piece of our glassware um, and just during the course of the project I was emailed by somebody at the Metropolitan Museum of Art who were putting together their own catalogue of their Cypriot glassware um, and he just wanted to confirm how many pieces we have, what do we have, 
And because we had done all this work already, I was able to very quickly send in the listing, send in the photographs, um, rather than, well, I think we've got some, it'll take me a few weeks to check, which would have been the case beforehand. Um, it wasn't always good news. Uh, I sent the, this picture to Thomas uh, at the British Museum saying, please give us a translation. And he came back to say, sorry, it's a fake translation. Uh, and it's not, um, it's by somebody who had no knowledge of Cypriosyllabic or Greek writing, he said. But we would still put it on display. And then you've got a whole story there about the, the vessel itself is genuinely ancient Cypriot. Um, but the inscription is historic in itself because obviously it must have been done before 1897. Okay. Uh, so each stand of the project has meant the next stage or opportunity was more feasible. So for example, I knew how many objects needed assessing because we had those skeleton records um, and we were able to easily get the objects out for photography as we've recorded their locations. And when it came to um, choosing objects for the display, because they had all already been conservation assessed, I knew which ones were robust, which ones were suitable for display, um, and some of them had been you know, in, improved for display through conservation. Um, and we had good photographs of everything as well. Um, the profile of the collection has been raised amongst curators, amongst our managers, academics and the public as well. And the skills that I've gained personally mean that I feel much more confident in approaching our next project, which will hopefully, uh, subject to funding, be to redisplay our ancient Egyptian collection, which again is an area I don't know a lot about, um, although I do know where Egypt is this time, so <laughs> one step ahead. Um, and just. The knowledge of knowing how long it takes even to get things out for a professional photographer to photograph them, how long it then takes to edit those photos, add them to the collection uh, database, um, that's all really been helpful in planning for, for future projects. If any of you uh, want to visit Sheffield to see the display, it will be on for quite a while, probably at least another uh, year, um, and here are my contact details. Thank you very much.